And so I'm going through that and making sure that the risk is commiserate with the value proposition to the company. So ma managing risk and making sure that we're getting the best deal we can. And what that risk is depends on the business deal. And so that's really working with my team to f and the clients I'm supporting to figure out, okay, what are we going to do here? What's the risk? What's, what's the worst thing that can happen? How, what's the likelihood of this happening and how do we protect? From the cubicle to the lab, the studio to the war room, climbing the corporate ladder or joining a scrappy startup, experience a day in the life of the jobs you want. This is the Experience a Day in the Life podcast. We interview professionals, entrepreneurs, and recent grads about what a day is actually like on the job, hour by hour, or as we like to call it, they're a diddle, spelled A-D-I-T-L, which stands for a day in the life. This podcast will inspire you to gain experience beyond the classroom and launch a career of your own. We're your hosts, Chris DeBeau and Matt Poe. Welcome to part one in the two-part space-based law series. In this episode, we'll experience a day in the life of Baker Arena, a commercial space and technology attorney, so you can decide if this is a career that's right for you. His company is a leading space technology provider of advanced space-based technology solutions, aka earth imagery, geospatial data, and more for private and public sectors to gain insight from. A company as cool as Maxar Technologies needs to protect what makes Maxar unique, their intellectual property, and be compliant with company practices. That's where Baker comes in as the corporate counsel at Maxar Technologies. Let's get right into the day. It was 6 a.m. in Denver, Colorado, and Baker was up and ready to start the day. The first thing he did was grab his phone and read the news. He then popped on NPR's Planet Money podcast, showered, got dressed, ate breakfast, and spent time with his girlfriend before he was out the door by 8 a.m. The agenda for this particular day, Baker had a call regarding company policies, a call with some software developers regarding a new product being developed, a follow-up on an NDA that needed signatures, a one-to-one -one weekly performance review with his boss, a phone call negotiation with a vendor, a lease agreement that needed his review, and more. <laughs> Let's meet Baker and learn more about what he does. I'm Baker Arena. I'm corporate counsel at Maxar Technologies, and Maxar Technologies is a space company. We have a lot of different branches. We have a satellite manufacturing and space equipment manufacturing branch. We have an imagery branch where basically we fly satellites and take pictures of the Earth. And we have a services branch where we use cutting edge analytics to analyze the imagery and to give our customers real time data about what's going on on the Earth. We've only had satellites for the last 60 or 70 years now. And what Maxar is seeking to be part of is the new space economy. We Space is the final frontier. And the way that I see this is just, the way I see Maxar in space is as if we're getting into the shipbuilding business and the exploration business in the 1500s. We are exploring the new frontier. We're giving end-to-end -end solutions for our customers to make sure that they can leverage the unique assets that our company has. They can leverage our capabilities to see the world as a whole and see it in real time and to make sure and to get the information they need so they can run their businesses. They can make the decisions that they need to make. They can help the people they need to help and they can make the world a better place. With any company, especially a technology company, intellectual property is one of the most important assets that that company has. With the intellectual property that I work on, I'm supporting our business team when they're coming out with new products, figuring out the best way to protect that intellectual property and make sure that going forward, we're the ones who can use it and no one else can ever infringe and that we are basically owning what we have invented and making sure we have protect those rights to keep other people out with the advertising and marketing. I'm working with teams to make sure that we are being upfront and truthful with what we are saying in our marketing practices and to make sure that the company is getting to our customers in the best way possible and have our brands pr completely protected so that no one else can use the Maxar brand in describing space technology. 
And with the commercial contracting, every business has tons and tons of contracts that we really don't think about. And that could be anything from the lease that the property's on that I would help with, or that could be with the contracts that we have with our bankers or the contracts we have with our janitors, the janitor company, or it could be the contracts that we have with some of our customers for cutting edge space technology. So it kind of runs the gambit. And so I help draft and negotiate those and make sure the company's interests are protected. I support a lot of the procurement functions. So we have to buy stuff and we have to go into contracts. So I support that type of work with the intellectual property. I support a bunch of the software developers, the engineers trying to bring their products to market. But that's, I support just a various various lines of business and I have the backing of the legal team. So if I have a question about something, I go to my other attorneys and say, okay, what's, what do we do on this? What's your opinion on this? And so it's kind of like I'm part of a team, but I have like an individual function within the team. So you get to work at 808 precisely. And can you just set the scene for us? Describe your, uh, your work environment. Yeah. So you got a badge in and our office is super cool. So you get in, I get in the elevator and I get up to the fourth floor and it's a super cool glass building and there's like pictures. So Maxar has a space imagery division. And so there's awesome pictures that they've taken throughout the last 20 years from space all around. So like every conference room has a cool picture of either like a mountain or a cool bridge in a city. And so the art there is awesome because it's just all images from the earth. Mm. Wow. That must be inspiring to walk into. <laughs> no, it is. It's like you get it. You, you're just like, okay, we're like, you forget that there's satellites in the air that you're helping support every day, but you get there and you're like, okay, well, we're actually doing something cool here. 812. Baker brewed his Guayusa tea. Guayusa, he learned from his girlfriend, is an Ecuadorian root from the Amazon, which has a lot of caffeine, vitamins, and antioxidants 815 he reviewed and visualized his schedule for the day with any day you need to figure out where you're going to get your work done what your process is going to be and so for me at least i need to prioritize everything because my time is not unlimited and the company is busy you said that you usually overestimate the amount of time that it's going to take you to complete something when did you get into that, ha that habit and why I think this was from being in the outdoors. You know, you want to give yourself a grace period. So if I'm going on a kayak or a rafting trip, I need to make sure that I have my clients back before dark. And if something happens on the river, we need to have a contingency and we need to have extra time available to get them back safely off the river. So we have goals and priorities to hit and objectives to complete by a certain time. And so I always like to give myself a little bit of a grace period just to make sure that the expectations are going to be met. And if there's an emergency that comes up, I can shift to that emergency and then still meet what I had told or what the expectations are from the business. So it's just kind of a way to A, not stress myself out and B, not feel rushed and perform my task. I want to be able to devote my full attention and really think through something and see, I want to have a contingency plan just in case something goes wrong. 840 Baker began reviewing and revising a consulting agreement with a vendor performing enterprise software development and implementation services. The vendor had requested changes to their agreement, so he had to negotiate. So a consulting agreement is you have someone who's coming in and they're going to do X, Y, and Z service for you. And so we have to make sure in that agreement that we have the appropriate protections in case the vendor does something crazy and ruins the system and the company crashes. Like we need, and obviously that's a super remote possibility, but we need to be protected in such instance. And we need to make sure that when the vendor creates something under this agreement that we're going to own it. We need to own the intellectual property rights like we discussed earlier. And so I'm going through that and making sure that the risk is commiserate with the value proposition to the company. So ma managing risk and making sure that we're getting the best deal we can. And what that risk is depends on the business deal. And so that's really working with my team. To f and the clients I'm supporting to figure out, okay, what are we going to do here? What's the risk? What's, what's the worst thing that can happen? How, what's the likelihood of this happening and how do we protect? 
And dealing with disagreements, it's you, the, disagreements don't have to be disagreeable. I can have a respectful disagreement with someone and say, look, this is not going to work for me for X, Y, and Z reason. If you want this business, we want your business. Let's figure out a reasonable alternative. And I'm not a hardliner. I'm, I don't, I'm not a hard ass on things. Obviously, if something's a huge risk, then I'm going to stand my ground, but I'm not going to be a jerk over it. It's a small legal community. I'm going to be polite and respectful and articulate our position, but it's going to be reasonable. And it comes down to really understanding the client and understanding Maxar, what Maxar's needs are and what the individual business teams that I'm supporting the needs are. So there's a lot of listening. Baker was able to negotiate terms both parties could agree upon that we can't discuss in detail, obviously. Before the agreement was final, at 9.17 on this day, Baker spoke to a colleague who works in procurement. He needed help with some specific deal terms they needed in the consulting agreement and needed specific information about whether the contractor may have access to the sensitive data. The conversation ended on the topic of their respective ski days over the past weekend. Baker thinks it's important to get to know your coworkers, but recognizes there's a fine line. There's topics you shouldn't touch upon when it comes to office convos. From an in-house attorney's perspective, it's you always want to have a great relationship with people because you want people to trust you and you want people to come to you whenever they have an issue. So the first thing I want is X, Y, and Z goes wrong, or I need help with X, Y, and Z. I want them to come to me because that's my job to help them. And, you know, I have a lot of experience helping people through their issues. And so building that relationship is really important. For me, at least, like I am friendly, but I also try to stay professional in my contact with people. Like I, like, obviously, like we talk about personal stuff, but not like... I, you know, I don't talk about politics or sex or any like offensive things in the office. I'm just like a reasonably polite person, you know, and that's how you just stay, re you just stay polite and respectful. Part of the thing is like, just live a life where like, if you told people your most personal totally. things, you're like not ashamed of them. <laughs> right. But, and also it's like, you don't need to tell someone, oh, I went out on Saturday night and drank this much beer. Like, right. That's inappropriate. Like people don't care. Being the super active person Baker is, at 9.30 on this day, Baker went to the cafeteria to eat some blueberry pancakes, a second breakfast, if you will. He told us he cannot focus when he's hungry. His doctor told him in a highly thought-oriented job, the brain burns a ton of calories thinking, so he needs to keep it fed. At 9.45, he got stopped by one of the contract managers in his department, who followed up on two NDAs they needed to execute with potential business partners. They have already been reviewed and approved, so he worked with her to get these agreements signed. An NDA is a tool that companies or individuals are going to use to keep information private. It basically gives you a contractual right to say, hey, don't tell anyone. And so, especially working in a super technical industry like I work in and being on the cutting edge of a lot of different processes, methods, products, technologies, we need to be super careful with who we tell what. And so an NDA is a tool to help manage that risk. And so this morning we had been going back and forth negotiating one, basically saying what happens in this instance or how do we protect this information? And so we were just being cautious and making sure, and we always have to execute that with business partners. The NDAs can be challenging because there's a lot of nuance in them. It's I can say I can say, Krista, don't tell anyone this. But then it's like, well, what if everyone else knows? And or what if I accidentally disclose it? Or how long do I have to not tell anyone for? Or if what if I use that information you gave me and I develop my own product with that information? Who is that considered disclosing it? And so there's a lot of nuance and subtlety that goes into negotiating them. And so they first they say, oh, this seems straightforward. Like, oh, don't tell anybody. But they're actually a little bit more tricky than a lot of people give them credit for. Now it was 1030. Baker hopped on a call to discuss intracompany policies, which are basically procedures that govern how the company operates. Since there are many business units that make up Maxar Technologies, he gave his input on provisions from a legal standpoint so everything can be as streamlined as possible. Could you explain the different business units that make up Maxar and the markets that they serve? So Maxar itself is a has a lot of different lines of business. 
And so we have a space systems line, which builds uh, satellite parts and robotics and builds satellites themselves. We have an imagery line, which has the satellites that are taking pictures of the Earth. And we have an analytics line, which is doing all the analysis and the services for our customers. And so each of those kind of operates, has a, like a different operating model. And so we just need to make sure that that's streamlined for our customers to make sure we're giving them the best product possible. And then who are the customers? Yeah. So we have all sorts of customers. We have global Fortune 2000 customers who are going to use our imagery for a whole host of reasons. We have people who are using our imagery for self-driving car technology. We have governments who are using our imagery for their intelligence gathering purposes. We have a whole host of customers and it's really awesome to be able to work with such a wide variety of customers who have so many different needs that we can tailor our solutions to meet their needs. At 11 a.m., Baker was on a call with two other attorneys and two software developers in the company regarding a potential new product, particularly how to license it, the legal considerations, and the IP protection. Maxar welcomes innovation like that. 12 p.m., Baker had lunch he brought from home. Practices like this one helped him pay off his student loans in two years. More on that in part two. He got back to work on finalizing the edits to the consulting agreement and intercompany policies from earlier. So let's move on to 2 p.m. You have the one-on-one -on -one with your boss, Lori. How important are these one-on-one -on -one sessions to just like your, your workplace well-being? What kind of relationship do you have with your manager? I have an awesome manager. Lori is one of, I've actually been super lucky throughout my career. I've had awesome bosses to work for. And, you know, some of my friends and they've had less than awesome bosses. And, but my bosses, I've had such a trusting and open relationship with. And they are really invested in me being able to do my best job and giving me the tools and support I need to do so. And also me being able to grow and become a better attorney and a better person. And so I value this one-on-one -on -one feedback that I get weekly with her basically saying, hey, look, this is what I'm working on. This is what I'm thinking we have issues with. How do, we, how do you think I should handle this? Um, and I kind of treat it like it's just kind of learning. And obviously there's, it's a little more back and forth because it's kind of like working through my daily workload or my weekly workload, working on my priorities, but it's also, what do you think I should do here? What's your advice? And how do we get the job done? After his one-to-one -one with his boss, he called his mom to chat for 10 minutes. Then at 2.40, he reviewed a software license. He told us that every single piece of software that you buy, you either have a right to access it or you have a license to access it. So when you click the I accept these terms and conditions, the agreements you're supposed to read but never do, you're accepting a software license. You know, in the context of major enterprise software that a company is going to buy from another company, you bet that someone's going to have to read those. And that's one of my responsibilities is to read and negotiate these software licenses to just to make sure that there's no hidden terms, there's no gotchas, and to make sure that the software license, it, the rights that were granted to use that software are commiserate with our intended use case. To say, we want to use this for X, Y, and Z. Can we use this for X, Y, and Z? And what happens if there, what, if, what if this relationship goes south? What are the risks? Just the same thing we would have in any contract is managing risk and making sure that the use case is appropriate. Software technology transactions have a lot of different aspects. So there's a lot of it revolves around the actual use and what happens if the software breaks? What happens if someone says, oh, the software is infringing my patent, I'm going to sue you. So we have to deal with that in the contract, but we also have to figure out what sort of data is going to be shared and how's that data going to be protected. Some software agreements don't have any data, but other so software agreements could have some super sensitive data like company financials or super big secrets that we can't let get out. So we have to be super protective of our data rights. And it also has um, some personal information. And personal data is a major issue in the legal industry right now because states are realizing that comp software or technology companies own so much personal data on you. That that's why when you think of something, it shows up on your Instagram feed two days later that you want to buy and you haven't even told anyone yet. You just <laughs> thought of it. Uh, they can analyze all your algorithms, all your user habits. And so we need to make sure that this ever-changing legal landscape of data privacy regulation, especially with regards to personally identifi identifiable information, is we're following the law. And it's complicated and tricky. 
3.30, Baker is on the phone negotiating with an opposing counsel regarding a master service agreement, which is basically a document stating how the relationship is going to work between the two entities. They were going back and forth on a comprehensive MSA for a vendor to provide various services to Maxar Technologies. Baker says this is one of the fun parts of his job. Getting on the phone with another attorney and saying, hey, look, and this is what we talked about earlier, we were disagreeing on this certain issue, and let's figure out how we can come to a reasonable conclusion on this. And you have to always be on your toes, and you always have to be thinking of your next argument. You have to keep your emotional calm and your cool and basically say, look, you know, obviously, like, this is annoying or they're being super unreasonable on this, I'm getting frustrated, but no, I need to stay cool. I need to get the job done and I need to complete what I need to complete and get the best deal for my client and my team. And so you're always on your toes, you're always thinking, and it's super fun. And you just sometimes like, they'll, they'll make a point and you have your argument already teed up, ready to go right back at them. And then you just serve it right back and then they have no response to it. And they're like, oh, we'll take that one offline and they talk about it. And when you get that, it's a really, really cool feeling. What would you say to a brandy new law student who gets nervous when they hear that they have to negotiate? You will not negotiate anything for the first couple of years. Don't worry about it. (laughs) Um, Like you will be preparing for the negotiations. You'll be helping the attorneys you're supporting preparing for the negotiations. You'll have to come up with arguments and you'll hone your skills and you'll be around it enough to when someone picks up the phone, you'll be able to, you don't even really think about it. You've been around it so much that it's like, okay, I'm just going to say what I need to say. And I'm not really going to overthink it because you have that much exposure and that much experience. It's, and you know, I used to get nervous before negotiations, but It's just progressive exposure. You just, that's the same thing as skiing. You ski enough black diamonds, they're not as scary anymore. And you work your way up. So you work your way up to the negotiations throughout your career. And then by the time they kind of set you free, usually it's low level stuff in the beginning. And then it's more high stakes bet the company. And I'm not at the high stakes bet the company. These are like, these are obviously big agreements, but they're not major. And we can always go back and fix them later if, if I screw up. 4.30, he checked back in with his to-do list and noticed he finished everything he wanted to get done today. Time to get ahead on other projects, like getting a lease agreement finalized for a company property to allow construction to start and reviewing some open source licenses in the new software product. He's not a real estate attorney by training, but as an in-house attorney, he's often asked to handle things that he may not have a lot of depth of knowledge on just yet. I think part of it is learning to learn and putting yourself in a position where you know that at the end of the day, you have the tools necessary either within you or you have the self-awareness to ask for help to get the job done. And so with the real estate stuff, I'm a little newer to that and I don't have as much experience, but I have, hey, I need help on X, Y, and Z. I'm going to go to Lori or I'm going to go to one of my other coworkers and say, what do you think of this? And I'm going to ask for help. You know, and so for me at least, it was, and I also took a lot of, or I read a lot of articles online, and then I listened to some online CLEs, which means continuing legal education. So they're just basically online legal education classes for practicing attorneys. So it was like a real estate for dummies 101 course that, like, and obviously, like, I've studied property law and I've done a couple of leases before and I've negotiated my own lease that I, in my current apartment, but I was able to kind of educate myself. 450 and a coworker from procurement popped in to ask a question regarding an agreement that he helped her with. He told us it's rare that this was his only visitor today. He also told us one of the reasons he loves his job so much is because he believes solving problems leads to happiness and he loves to help people solve their problems. 5 p.m. He finished the lease agreement and started to review open source licenses in the new software product to determine if there was going to be any issue with the proposed distribution method. In case you don't know what open source software is, well, we'll let Baker take this one. Basically, if you have an awesome software idea, you can release it to the public on an open source license, which basically says anyone can use this software. The issue that sometimes occurs is that software uh, license will have weird restrictions on the end user. So sometimes it'll say you can use this, but you have to say in your software file, like a TXT file, 
that, hey, this module, this open source module is part of it. And it was divine, designed by so-and-so guy in 2003. And so you have to make sure that you're complying with those terms or you could get in trouble or get sued for a breach of the license. The other issue we would have is sometimes they say, if you're going to use this open source license and you're going to incorporate it into a compilation work. So let's say there's like a one executable within a module that we had developed that's open source. So we're like using a tool to, to help with the functionality of the software that's open source. It could so infect the entire, and in fact, I'm using air quotes for the people listening on the radio. Uh, it could infect the entire application and cause the entire application to have to be released on an open source basis, which means for free. So you we have to be careful and attorneys who work in software have to be careful for open source just to make sure that what the company spend all this time and money and effort developing is protectable and doesn't have to be released for free on an open source basis. He left the office at 5.30 on that day and called his dad, who's also an IP attorney, on his way home. His evening routine usually consists of exercising, cooking dinner, if it's his turn, and spending time with his girlfriend. He's usually in bed by 9.15. What's next for Baker? I don't know. I think, you know, in my personal life, I want to continue to travel and explore the world. My goal is to ski on all seven continents. And so just kind of working my way towards that. And in my professional life, I really, really like my job. And I work for a super cool company and I want to stay for a while. Um, and I really want to grow and learn the business. And um, there's a ton of opportunity in such an interesting and cool company. So I w really want to continue to grow and just grow my legal skills and be just more developed and more well-rounded as an attorney. So you just experienced a day in the life of a commercial space and technology attorney, but how does one actually become one? In part two of the space-based law series, join us as we go through Baker Arena's career journey and experiences leading up to where he is today. Baker's love for learning is what made him thrive at his job today, but it's also what ultimately led him to decide to attend law school after spending a couple of years after undergrad working as a ski and whitewater rafting instructor. Learn how he paid his undergrad and law school loans off in only two years and found a job that he absolutely loves. Stay tuned. At Experience a Day in the Life, we're building an online library of content all focused on a diddle or a day in the life of different jobs and professions across the world in all different industries. So if you want to share your a diddle, you can do so at xadiddle.com slash share dash my dash a diddle that's x a d i t l dot com slash share dash my dash a d i t l thanks for listening head over to x a diddle dot com that's x a d i t l dot com there you can find the show notes for this series and more a day in the life articles and you can get to know us and our guests more by joining our communities on social media. Follow at xadiddle on Instagram and on LinkedIn by searching for Krista Bow and Matt with one T Poe. If you learned something in this episode, please take some time to help our mission by leaving a positive rating and review of the show. Each week, we bring you a new interview series with guests from different jobs and different industries. In each series, we'll live a specific day in the life, hour by hour, and experience their career journey. So don't forget to subscribe.